How important is it for the Utah Utes to keep their recruiting footprint in Southern California with the Pac-12 and potentially adding San Diego State? We'll talk about it on today's Locked on Utes. You are Locked on Utes, your daily podcast on the Utah Utes. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and thank you for making Locked On News your first listen every single day. We are available on all platforms, including YouTube. Love to interact with you guys on social media at Locked On News, as well as in the com- con- comments of our YouTube channel. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. My name is JT Wistersill, former intern inside the University of Utah Athletic Department, and my guest joining me. Pretty much every Monday, as he's done, is the phenomenal Brian Brown. Brian, appreciate you coming on with us. Brian, the former host of this podcast. And Brian, we got, uh, you know, usually Coach Witt's press conferences are pretty vanilla, but we got a little couple of juicy things today. We're going to talk about the Van Fillinger injury and kind of what that entails in a moment. But first, want to talk about the potential addition of San Diego State. So Dan Patrick on his show, which I don't know how reliable of a source Dan Patrick is anymore, said that the Pac-12 is looking into adding San Diego State and that he expects an announcement as soon as this week, I believe. Now, that has been refuted by numerous people, but Coach Witt did mention that he thinks it's important to kind of keep that footprint in Southern California. So with San Diego State, another thing that'd be nice for Utah is in the Pac-12 in general is with the Big Ten adding UCLA and USC at the moment, the ratio in terms of power five conferences in California would be two to two. If you look at then Stanford and Cal, and obviously those teams are nowhere near the power and carry the name cachet of a USC and a UCLA. But if you can at least add San Diego state, no, it's not a great program right now in terms of a power five program and all that that entails, but you still have the advantage three to two. And I just think it's another opportunity to be in that area. Plus we saw Utah come in from the mountain West and obviously they were able to grow and become something really good. And I think San Diego state could potentially have the chance to do the same thing, having an opportunity to capitalize on that California recruiting class. And when you're talking about the meccas of high school football, there's obviously California, Texas, which I'm always going to be a little partial to Florida as well. So there's a lot. Those are the three you really want to have a strong recruiting footprint in. We know how good they do in Florida, Jalen Glover, how well they do in Texas. What an addition Braden Daniels has been. And then look at California. I mean, there's over 20 players on this Utah football roster from California. Some of those guys being Clark Phillips, Nate Johnson, Makai Bernard, Cam Rising, Devon Bailey, and Makai Cope. So some pretty big names, especially on the offensive side of the ball, and only the best defensive player. And then you even got four guys in the class of 2023 that are in there from California. So I do think it's important that the Pac-12 continues to have a footprint there. And I guess the question is then, does if they don't add it, Would it hurt them going forward in recruiting? I think it would only help to have another school down there. So I do think if they didn't add it, it might hurt it a tad. But I think Utah would be okay. But either way, it's really important for them to keep their recruiting foothold in California. I blacked out after you used a four-syllable word next to my name, something about pheromonal or something (laughs) like that. I don't even – what? What? Like, bro, I'm I'm simple. Like, this is Brian. He says things – on show that's that's my level of understanding effectively (laughs) yeah but on a serious note thank you for having me on as always it's great to be here uh you know on our tuesday slot yes um the unfortunate part about it is there wasn't a whole lot in the press conference to talk about (laughs) other than maybe the recruiting footprint i think the unique aspect of it is that when you watch trends in recruiting the California market and the California area is slowly thinning. There are not as many okay. athletes coming out of the California area. A lot of that is economical, right? Because the cost of living in California is so high that a lot of families, especially middle class or lower middle class families, are moving to places like Arizona, Nevada, and Utah. And so we've seen in those places over the years that those recruiting rankings and the, and the level of players has, has escalated uh, pretty substantially. Another unique aspect to it, a lot of Hawaiian born players are now on the mainland Good because point. of COVID. And so those those activities have all really diversified the footprint of recruiting. And and you know, th- there was a lot of different uh, how Utah recruits is very unique, right? Because it is a unique school, it's still a unique state. You know, you mentioned Texas. They like to try and get a few players out of Florida. You know, Jalen Glover, I think, is 
is the current banner winner for, for uh, Florida recruits. Uh, California will always be, you know, a, a mainstay. But I think it's also important to recognize the t- the type the type of recruits that that mm-hmm. Utah is getting from there. It's primarily skill players, right? Primarily, but there are a few quarterbacks in there. We talked about Nate Johnson, Cam Rising, um, and there's one other guy as well who just escaped my name. But either I mean, Nate Johnson's the main one because I feel like that's Quinton the guy Jackson who- came from Texas, right? Yeah. You know, Peter Costelli was a California one. Uh, he who must not be named, Jack Tuttle, also <laughs> a California cornerback. There's a lot of reasons for it, right? Year round uh, QB coaching and, and and the ability to get out and work year round the developmental prospect process all that stuff has been relatively new to the state of utah but as we recognized earlier this week with isaac wilson getting an offer the younger brother to zach wilson the caliber of quarterback play here in state is is substantially better and and, and isaac's not even was substantially only... better than california you think uh no not 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 possible better than it's just, yeah, yeah 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 i got you yeah i got and, you and california recruits and, and the other thing too is when we talk about recruiting it's how do you guys get evaluated right sure. so the very first point that for most players of point of contact is at these seven on seven camps or something like that where there is an evaluator from either 24 7 or espn or you know whatever recruiting service it is that that are out there and that's where they start the evaluation so it's the kids that go to those camps first and foremost that get the evaluations early on now that's part of the reason why Jackson Dart was such an under the radar recruit, you know, and 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 again, that's one, another one of those names that we're not supposed to talk about, right? Because it didn't end up at Utah, but that's kind of the way the the game is going to go. So the fascinating part about it for me is is that there's still a bit of an old school mentality with what Kyle said, right? Like they want to be there for the recruiting footprint so that they can go play a game in Southern California, so families can come out and watch the teams, all that kind of stuff. Um. I mean, that's important, but with the new changes in the Pac-10-ish, or however teams of many are, like, there's no reason why you can't go play uh, uh, neutral site games at, at SoFi in yeah. L.A. and still get that same kind of result. Mm-hmm. Number one. Number two, the bigger concern, I think, should be NIL, and, and Kyle's even mentioned that as well. So it, it's unique because I think there's still so much of that old school approach and mentality with Kyle. But at the same time, uh, the scape and the scope of recruiting is always ever changing. And the other thing too is uh, the last outside of Nate Johnson, uh, who is the last out of state quarterback that Utah recruited directly from high school that actually played? That yeah, that actually played to the question because I think Mac isn't Mac Howard. I think he's a California guy, but it doesn't feel like he's gonna end up. Mac playing. Howard's Mississippi kid, yeah, or Mississippi so, kid. Thank you, actually, yep. yeah. Um, yep. But you're right. And then uh, so Nate Johnson will probably have the chance to. Uh, but uh, yeah, in history wise, uh, you are right. So we never up. saw Peter Costelli. Yep. Peter Costelli never saw the field. Jack Tuttle. If we go back in time, Corbin Laux. You know, yep. it, it very well may be Jordan Wynn, right? That was the last high yeah. school recruited quarterback that actually played for the University of Utah. The last couple of times it's been through the portal, right? We right. saw it with Cam Rising. Tyler Huntley was from Florida. Uh, mm-hmm. So, I mean, that that probably qualifies you know uh troy williams was a transfer in for a long time utah was good with going for juco quarterbacks we saw with john hayes terrence kane you know all these names that you probably never heard of that i remember clear as day because i've been around for you know since dirt Mm -hmm. but um (laughs) i don't know about that (laughs) and listen i'm old enough to remember when the stadium was part dirt so so there is (laughs) there's that factor to it but that's the uniqueness right is that, that the footprint is maybe not so important but it's still a talking point for Kyle. Yeah. And I think, you know, that was something that I'm noticing more and more is that his pressers at the beginning of the year, they're so great. They're so informative. There's so much good stuff coming. And as the year starts to get closer and closer and, and the more the team starts to encounter adversity, the tighter and tighter all those comments get, right? We're not mm-hmm. talking about injuries. And Utah is absolutely decimated by injuries right now. Yes. The only thing we got was Van Fillinger being hurt. Yeah. So. You know, whether or not San Diego State comes in the conference, something not that important to me in the current moment. I think, you know, from everything I've heard, everything I've read, it seems like the more important thing is to get the media rights deal secured first. And then we can talk about uh, expansion. But, you know, like you mentioned, we've seen teams that once elevated, you know, money is a huge factor. And and, then I I would be curious to see what kind of money San Diego State could come up with. They'll certainly have a beautiful stadium to play in. Yeah, just got the new one in there. Um, I know it's a little hot out there. I don't know if you saw that game versus Arizona, all the TikToks that got published after that. The heat was insane there, but it, it is a nice venue, so that's a good point. 
Yeah, you got to be careful because San Diego doesn't get to 90 very often, yeah. um, you know, but uh, as someone who used to go watch games at the old Jack Murphy Stadium, I think anything is an improvement uh, from the place that used to have tube TVs uh, displaying all the games. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. And Do you even know what a tube TV is? Can I just move on to the next segment? <laughs> <laughs> next question please next question yeah no no comment at this time i'll pull a coach win at the moment um we'll just we'll keep that answer in-house i cannot confirm it now <laughs> at the in our estimation tube tvs never existed yeah exactly <laughs> i love that you brought up van fillinger though because we're going to talk about his injury and how utah is going to go about replacing him in a moment but first want to tell you guys about our friends at nissan our partners at nissan have worked with us to create a new segment across the locked on college network titled thrilling moments where we highlight the most exciting plays from the utes this past week weekend or just throughout the history and for this week's thrilling moment gosh there's so many to pick one i thought there were so many good moments and just fun moments in this game you know what for me it just it just epitomizes the team win that this was for utah i'm gonna go with tavion thomas getting his tackle on kickoff coverage the whole stadium erupted i could also go tavion just coming into the game seeing the whole stadium erupting seeing how excited all his teammates were for him it's just his story coming back from this team we don't know what he's battled that's none of our business in terms of we know the loss of a family member and a few of those other things but he was obviously able to willing to do whatever was necessary to come back with this team and i thought it was so great just to see him out there so that's my thrilling moment what would you go with brian uh, Nate Johnson getting his first two scores of, of his career and also mixing in the Jalen Waddle celebration yeah. in between. So a uh, big moment, a yeah, guy I'm, I'm a huge fan of, I uh, think we'll have great success at the University of Utah. And it was fun to see him really show out and demonstrate what, you know, what that skill set really is. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. This segment has been inspired by the thrilling new designs featured across Nissan's new lineup of vehicles. Pursue what thrills you in the new all new Frontier, Armada, or Pathfinder today. Available now at NissanUSA.com. Also, want to talk to you guys about UCCU. Guys, as you know, inflation rates are on the rise, or interest rates and inflation are on the rise. So, UCCU is offering a 15 month serving service saving certificate with an incredibly high APY of 4.00%. So that's once again, a 15th month savings certificate with an incredibly high APY of 4.0%. Plus you can jump up to an even higher rate of return anytime during the life of your certificate. We know that those interest rates are going up a lot higher. So you can get a serving certificate with for as little as $500, making this an awesome opportunity for every type of saver, big or small. Go check it out. UCCU allows you to jump up your interest rate once anytime during the life of your savings certificate. The, that way, it yields to continue to rise and just options to jump up even higher with great savings tool in the rising interest environment. So visit uccu.com to learn more. Get a savings certificate today. UCCU, love where you bank. And once again, it's a limited time offer of 15-month savings certificate with an incredibly high APY of 4.00% and a variety of terms and options to match your specific needs and once again thank you for making lockdown it's your first listen every day for your second listen go check out locked on sports today from the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insight only locked on can provide locked on sports today available on this app youtube and wherever you get your podcast so brian coming back in uh van fillinger was a guy who i think a lot of people were he was ruled out for the game um we didn't know where he what was what to make of that injury is we don't get a lot of injury updates unless they're season ending. And unfortunately that proved to be the case with Van Dillon. So he's out for the season, tough loss for this Utah team, led them in sacks, was coming off a great game against Washington state where he had a sack and a half and also had numerous pressures in that game. And last year in November and kind of that December area is where he really kicked it into high gear and felt like he was trending towards that way. So it's a tough loss for this Utah team. Now they still have Gabe Reed who has three and a half sacks, but when you combine Jonah Ellis, Connor O'Toole and Mickey Sugataraka, you only get a total of two sacks. And I will say, sacks aren't everything. Pressure rates much more important. But it does just show you, just kind of an example of when you kind of watch these games, especially watching them back, of how infrequent the pressure can be sometimes. Yes, Utah is eventually able to get back there, but there was still, the reason my whole first takeaway yesterday was the performance by the secondary is because early on that game, Jaden Delora still had five seconds to throw and still didn't have anywhere to go. There was the one time in the end zone where he had another example where like Utah has a chance to get a safety here. It took seven seconds in the pocket and then scrambles out to the left. So pressure is something that's going to be an issue for this Utah team pretty much for the entire season at this point. I mean, when you look at their sack leaders outside of Van, it's Gabe Reed, um, as we mentioned, uh, Karene Reed, Lander Barton, and Diabate before you get to the next defensive end. Now, thankfully, they're getting a little bit more of that interior push. It was great to see Aliki Vaimahi get a sack this last week, but 
This is a tough loss for this Utah team that struggled to get pressure with four. And I think this is a big concern going forward. And I think Utah is going to have to continue to blitz to get pressure. Well, and that's always been a part of Utah's uh, MO. I, I think the bigger loss with Van Fillinger is you lose a leader on the defensive line. You lose one of your most experienced players. And that's the bigger issue in my my estimation is that he's a guy that knows where people need to be. He has some versatility, able to drop into coverage from the defensive end position. And yeah, you always want to get sack production. Sacks are an easy way to end a pass play. But I, I mean, you mentioned that Utah's got what, 10 sacks on the year. So you're maybe getting 10, you know, you know, two, three plays max that are going to end in a sack. Yeah. The bigger thing is getting teams off the field and stopping the run, which Utah has not been as, uh-huh. um, you know, devout in as we've seen in years past. And that's the area where I, I think the loss of Van Fillinger shows up the most. And we've seen Utah get very versatile with how they're using packages, right? Yeah. Mo Diabate started coming off the edge a lot more, something he yeah. should have been doing at the very beginning of the year, uh-huh. you know, in my le- basement knowledge you know, level but hey, of, no, but Hey, to defend you stuff. real quick, like, that's what he did at Florida for two years. And then they moved him off ball. So rather yeah. than when you have those opportunities, you had so much success with Devin Lloyd rushing last season, you get another guy who we were all like, he'll fill the Devin Lloyd world. That's all we talked about with him was that he was going to be able to stop the run. And on third downs, he'll be rushing the passer a lot more than he is dropping in coverage. And that hasn't proven to be the case. So I'm with you. He should have been rushing from the start. And we saw what the effect of having Lander Barton on the field more was uh-huh. for the University of Utah oh, defense. Like Lander is a player, and and this is one of those things that I will always harp on the program is they are always late to trust guys in game. And and yeah. part of the problem is, is that you have to allow players to learn and make mistakes. And Utah is a yeah. developmental program to the degree that they don't they. <clears throat> They believe that they can develop players to be ready-made on the field and and manage those the, the number of mistakes. Uh, I think that's proven to be somewhat true, uh, but I also believe that Utah is a better football team when they're putting their athletes out on the field to make athletic plays. Yeah, and I think we saw some of that from you know Clayton Isbell who made a few mistakes. You know, yep. took a bad angle on on the early touchdown from uh, I, I believe it was Delora on the keeper. Um, yeah there in the first half right yep. uh but you know stepped up and played well in other situations and, and yep. led this team of tackles I mean, you know it from my eye and, and i think everybody else sees it the same way it's it's pretty evident that there's some guys out there that can play and need to get reps you know sione vaki was phenomenal against uh washington state were there yep. mistakes and errors absolutely did it cost them the game no yep. so i think that's some of what the challenge is as, as a coach is, is when do you pick a guy to come, come in and, and really make a play for you? Uh, and, and when can, when do you feel comfortable trusting them to make mistakes? All this being wrapped up in the, the idea that they, we've seen a lot of defensive ends come into the game for Utah, right? right? And we're seeing more of the packages. You know, you see Clark Phillips get a sack not too long ago. We saw JT Broughton yeah. get a sack against Arizona, you know? So ways to get pressure. There's plenty of ways to do it. And, and I think the other thing, too, is Jonah Ellis is becoming, you know, my friend group and I, we call him the loiterer because he's just out there always just loitering in the backfield bugging quarterbacks he's like the little brother that nobody wants around back there and he's just causing havoc and creating chaos and i love it i'm here for it jonah ellis is becoming a fan favorite he's becoming a brown bear favorite and so when you look at it from that perspective i think the pressure aspect is is important right but it's it's when you look at the last three games left on the schedule and and how crazy is it that there are only three games left right wild absolutely wild well i like to say I like to say there's four, by the way, Brian. Yeah, well, (laughs) I would agree with you. Regardless, Utah's getting four because they will get to a bowl game, but possibly five, right? And maybe six. Who knows? Things are getting crazy out there. Very much so. What's Saturday? The bottom line, yeah. The bottom line is that Stanford is a winnable game as is, right? That that's not a team that you really have to go out of your way to compete against. The problem is, is that Oregon is getting better and better. And that's not the same Oregon team that Utah played last year. Nope. Not even close. Bo Nix is a much better football player than he was at Auburn. They found some things that really fit his style and and make him a really high-functioning, high, highly efficient quarterback. And the whole no Nix stuff that we used to see where he would have these peaks and valleys has really minimized into a really smart, really savvy, very athletic football player. Yeah. 
And Oregon is kind of rolling opponents without much effort. Uh-huh. And so that's going to be a game where that's the one I look at and I, I wonder to myself, okay, is this a game where we really miss Van Fillinger? Because yeah. his ability to contain on the edge, and, and that was one thing that I noticed that UCLA uh, – or uh, excuse Arizona. me. Arizona? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they uh, missed him. Yeah, and 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 that's going to be huge against an Oregon team that has a phenomenal offensive line that really does good things in the run game that likes to spread it out, likes to run that counter screen, right? Where you fake the the counter action and then throw the ball to the outside. You yep. need guys who are going to be disciplined in reading their keys, and so that's where I look at the loss of Fillinger being a, a big big deal. And and you've got to get guys coached up, and you've got to get guys ready to go. Uh, not so much. I mean. You'll have your opportunities to play guys in, against Stanford, you know, but it, it's that Oregon game that becomes a critical piece. There's a, yeah, there's a lot to unpack in what you just said. I think I'll start with the Oregon piece as well. I'll add that uh, just the Bonex upgrade versus Anthony Brown. Um, look, I really don't like saying coaches are checked out, but just that whole deal with Mario Cristobal last year, the done, like it seemed like he was going to Miami, the way it ended, mm-hmm. I just, if he had been, if he was committed to stay at Oregon, I think it would have been a different effort. We kind of saw from those teams as well. And he would have been a little more engaged, even his last press conference. It just, everything, the end there just was very weird. And that's not the sense I get with Dan Lanning, who is not going to Auburn, despite people trying to push those reports out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. And, and that was a good job by, uh, John Wilner to go straight to the source for that, or uh, not John. John Willander, but John Canzano yeah. goes straight for the force, source of that one. And it makes a lot of sense. Lanning came to Oregon with a purpose of staying there, building yes. a program and, and trying to compete. And look, like everybody says that the appeal of going back to the SEC is so great. Do you really want to go back and play Alabama, Auburn. LSU, Auburn? Yeah, like at yeah. Auburn. Do you want to be the coach of Auburn? Auburn? Yeah. Who Were wants there? to go back and coach yeah. Auburn right now? I get that you're going to get a paycheck out of it, but guess what? Dan Lanning can coach at Oregon for the next 10 years and make double yeah. whatever he'll make for that three-year deal or, or however many years they give him. All they, he won't last two. Yeah, and, and, and the problem is is that you've got LSU that's rolling. you got Alabama yep. that's rolling. you got Ole Miss that's Tennessee. on the come up, right? You know, And, and then Georgia, Tennessee. Like the, Who would want to go back to the SEC when you own the Pac-12 and you're clearly oh, yeah. going to have an opportunity to go to the playoff now? So yeah, I, I, I yeah, I, right. I, we're on the same play, same page with this one. I, yeah, so I just all that stuff factors in, right? Like, and it's just you know, I think the other part about with Crystal Ball is he's terrible on quarterbacks. You yeah, know? and awesome. clearly what Dan Land, Dan yeah, Landing has guess, like stock is just plummeted, Miami. and then it's super disappointing, I, right? I because like ball, but it's just uh, it's been well, but we've seen it, right? It was with with Herbert had the same issues. All of a sudden, he goes to the yeah. Chargers, and everybody's like, "Who's this guy?" Well, it's yeah, everyone's all had, that Tua was taken. That two, he was taken before Tua. That's really turned around. <laughs> well, it has, and and then you know he's he's fought through a lot of injuries this year, and, and probably yeah. hasn't had as good a season as maybe people were anticipating. Uh, missing his two best targets, whatever. Uh, the point yeah. stands that like when you get the right coaches and the right people in place, and and allow your players to excel then you can have a really great program and, and that's what landing is built i think this all circles back around to the the point that like um you know where the pac-12 is and, and and everything that we went through over the summer lo and behold things are not nearly as bad as everybody thought it was yeah. and they're actually in a really good position and i think it makes what's happening at utah that much more almost like gripping right now right because there's so many injuries and so many guys that are falling out every week, and and you've got to be at your best when you go to Oregon. You do have to be at your best when you go against Oregon, and that's an important thing. And we're going to talk a little bit more just about this Utah team in a moment. But first, I want to talk to you guys about our friends at Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for betting football and the start of a new basketball season. College basketball is here, so make sure you guys head over to Bet Online, cash in on the action. NBA, NHL, you guys can find it all, and of course, NFL too. All of it available on Bet Online. It remains your continued source for all your sports wagering information with live betting and up to the minute scores for every sport out there. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet Online, where the game starts. And jumping ahead a little bit to Bet Online in this one, the one thing that I think is also important to talk about, Brian, is this line Utah versus Stanford. <laughs> Utah's favored by 24 right now. And to be honest with the way they looked against Arizona and the way Stanford looked versus Washington State, at this moment, I would take Utah. Yeah, and, and then I mean, if you're playing the money line, then Utah's the obvious pick with that one, right? But a 24-point spread, and Utah's been pretty reliable against the spread for most of the year. Uh, I believe they covered against Arizona. What was it, 14 and a half? 
against Arizona, it was, yeah, it was 14. I, I thought it was actually something. Seven. Was it 14, 17? Either way. That's was, right. That's right. 17. Yeah. Uh, we had this same back and forth last week. You'd think that yeah. I would remember <laughs> it. Um, my brain is full of, of high school playoff stuff as well as hey. uh, Utah things. And, and uh, so there's only so much space up there, even though it does look like it's a big spot. Um, but the squirrel, the squirrel got the squirrels doing overtime up there. Oh boy. We're in that season, you know, and Christmas is around the corner. And so we're oh. thinking about that kind of stuff and trying to keep Mariah Carey out of the head for as long <laughs> as we possibly can. Always a struggle. But, um, the bottom line is that, you know, it, it's a spread that reflects where these two programs are at and, and really where Utah has dominated Stanford for the past couple of years. Yep. I was talking to some people uh, at the Utah game on Saturday, just what's going on on Stanford? Well, they missed out on three or four recruiting cycles, and then they got decimated by injury at the running back position. And when you're trying to run an offense that's built on that slow mesh and you don't have a running back who can run it, it, it really does devastate a lot of what you're trying to do. So, you know, a lot of big things going on with Stanford, but you look at, you know, now that they've got the admissions thing settled out and got all that stuff going, um, it, and now that they can get guys admitted and signed for that early signing period, now all of a sudden Stanford's got a really strong cr- class coming in for 2023, and you're, I think you'll see things level out a little bit, but they're still struggling behind a lot of those, you know, injuries and those losses. Mm-hmm. Very good point. And uh, Brian, we both had a chance to watch the tape from this Utah football game. My biggest takeaway was just the performance by the offensive line, just how big those holes were. And yes, Jaquindon and Jalen's vision is improving, but man, those holes were, whew, like I said yesterday, you could drive a truck through those things. Like I was so impressed. Johnny Maia filling in at center. He was phenomenal. Was. I really like what I saw from this offensive line. That was my biggest takeaway from watching the tape. What was yours? Yeah, I think that was a big part of it. Logan Kendall and his Ooh, emergence yes. every, as an every inline end. Every week, so much improvement from week to week, right? And he's becoming such a force. Just the the almost the velocity with which he comes down on those down blocks is so strong. It's allowing Utah a lot to to do some things that are um, basic, but also like a, little nuances to their schemes. That's really making you know, like you said, those holes open up. Um, you know, I think the other thing I saw in the film was just uh, this is a unit that this is a team that's that's kind of fighting through it on grit and guts right now. You yeah. know, there are a lot of guys that are not moving as well as they were at the beginning of the season, guys that are slow to get up, you know, guys that are kind of uh, lethargic. I don't want to say lethargic, but like you can see that the physicality of playing football at the University of Utah has taken a toll on them. Uh, and so watching that film, you know, any guy out there that that still is playing, you know, like we, like you mentioned, Johnny Maia, I, I thought was really great. Mm-hmm. You know, I think uh, they're starting to mix a little bit more movement into their schemes up front. We're seeing more power, more more counter trade. And I think some of that is because of what Jaquinnon brought to the table. Now, are we going to be able to see him or, or Jalen on Saturday? I very skeptical. I know. That's where it's nice that Makai seems to be getting back healthy. Um, Tavion getting more back integrated in the offense and really seems committed to this team to help them win. It's going to be a big thing for them going forward. And last thing I want to talk about before we get you out of here, Brian, is Utah basketball is back tonight, or I should say last night by the time you guys hear this, because mm-hmm. uh, Long Island will officially be playing the Utes tonight in their first game, official game of the season. They did the exhibition versus Westminster, but this is the first one that matters for the record. So I did a big basketball show last week, and for me, I think for Utah, if we're looking at bold predictions, we'll do that. I was going back and forth if I wanted to do that or something else. I said it on bold predictions. For me, I think this Utah team will win a, f- a few more games. That's not the bold p- prediction. My bold prediction is they will win a game in the conference tournament. They will upset someone, and they will win a game in the conference tournament, leading people to be very optimistic about this team heading into the 2023-2024 season. What's your bold prediction for the running Utes? My bold prediction is that Wilkins Exact A is the newcomer of the year oh. in the Pac-12 oh. conference. I like that a lot. That is a guy. If you can buy stock on him as well as my guy, Kieva, buy all of the stock on those two players, whatever the future of Utah basketball looks like, those two are going to be absolutely essential in it. And it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. And you know, something else that's going to be a lot of fun to watch this week, Brian, is uh, there's some pretty still cool stuff going on in Rice Eccles Thursday and Friday before the game Saturday. Can you can you tell us about that? Well, it is Utah High School football playoffs up at uh-huh. Rice Eccles Stadium. I believe 6A is on Thursday, and I believe 5A is on Friday. Right. Uh, KSL Sports, a uh, good friend of both yours and mine, yeah. will be doing streams of all the games, so be sure to tune in because, like we said, Isaac Wilson just received an offer from the University of Utah, uh-huh. and for those who are poo-pooing it, I think it is a very legitimate oh, offer. I think yeah. Utah is very much 
uh, in pursuit of Isaac. And you and I had the, uh, what the pleasure, the luxury, the blessing of being able to call his game last week. And yeah, I was in, in, incredibly impressed with him. JT, I don't know about you. In those conditions were literally the reason I've been coughing this entire podcast is because <laughs> I was out in the weather in that game. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and he did and that. Right. It was incredible. Why, why I still can't really talk right. And, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I sound like I've been uh, sitting on a pack of heaters from Marlboro for about the last 16 weeks. But, um, you know, he was incredibly impressive. And it, it's just the nuances of the game are the things yes. that he's starting to really grasp. The ability to move in the pocket, you know, making decisions, waiting, being patient, going through his reads. You know, that all that combined with the arm talent and the accuracy was really impressive. And, you know, we also watched Kitten Drew Patterson, who was really you know, yep. impressive from Corner Canyon against a West High program that has a slew of Division One prospects, including a few guys that I think the University of Utah is targeting uh, both in 2023 and 2024. So, you know, uh, you know, as as we talk about all all these in state players and talk about recruiting, even you know, Winningham and Utah. You, you mentioned what was it? Three kids from the state in state that are committed. Yep. Three kids right, from California. Twenty four from California. Right, that's going to change a lot because in twenty twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, there are so many good high school recruits here in the state of Utah, and the level of football is so much more competitive that you can go get the kind of guys that you want from these in-state classes and especially as Utah starts to divert more into uh, building trenches and, 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 and linebackers and, and tight ends and defensive ends, you know, Roger Saliapaga is a guy that you and I both oh are gosh. very, you know, know. very high on and caught two Hail Marys back to back at the end of the first half uh, uh, for Orem. You know, the first one was called back. And so they just did it again. Uh, you know, he's a guy that uh, projects it incredibly well at what Utah wants to do at tight end. You know, the route wide receivers too are, are, are starting to really emerge in this state. And we take saw a care. couple for, mm-hmm, yeah, well, I mean, take care of setting records left and right, but you're going to do yep. that as a wide receiver at corner Canyon, you know? Um, but there are a ton of other guys a, a, across the board. So this is a great opportunity for Utah fans to tune in and see how legitimately good, High school football is in the state, you know, catch, you know, and I don't know, I mean, some clown's going to be on the pregame show. Like, you know. <laughs> pregame, yeah. halftime, and post, correct? Yes. yes. <laughs> I'm going to be planted in that chair for uh, for rewind uh, all day, every day. So we're going to have to really buckle up and uh, uh, bring out the cold weather gear and, and perhaps, you know, invest in some serious snackage. But, um, you know, it's a great opportunity. We talk about it like high school football is important in the state because it's what leads to Utah being who they are, right? Yeah. If if you don't get recruits like, oh, uh, Nate Orchard, for example, yeah. you know, and, and Nate Orchard was at the game on Saturday and, and Yogi Ra talked about him a little bit on the broadcast. Like Nate Orchard was a guy who established Sac Lake City and, and really put yeah. Utah on the map and Utah's defense like, right down the road at Highland High School, you know, so. In, in-state recruits are very critical to a program and you know i there were times where i said i didn't think it was that important to go quote unquote steal your recruits back but at, at that point in time there are better recruits out there that you talk to go get now it's a different story you have to go get the good recruits that are in state because there are so many of them mm-hmm there are so many. There's so many good ones. It just makes me cry, Brian. It just brings tears yeah. to my eyes. There's just yeah, so many. Man. Got you all stuffed up. And yep. Got excited, me all I'm just all excited. And it's a great tease as well, because we're going to talk about Isaac Wilson on tomorrow's show, as well as a few, as well as who we expect from this Utah team to walk on Senior Saturday, which is coming up. It's going to be a fun one and a cold one, as Brian is in for Thursday and Friday. And all of you guys attending the game will be in for Saturday. But we appreciate you, as always, for making Locked On News your first listen every day. And once again, if you're looking for a second listen, make sure you check out Locked On Sports Today, the biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day. Available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcast. We appreciate you for joining us on today's episode of Locked on Utes, and we'll see you tomorrow.